From Tally to Cali, it's time to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Warchant.com is your ultimate seminal sports source. And this is Wake Up Warchant, presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. One more corner pocket. Now here's Warchant.com's ass on Hunch of Andy and Corey Clark. Wake up! What is up, everybody? It's Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. Coming up on today's show, observations galore. One-on-one, seven-on-sevens, 11-on-11 work. We detail every single snap. And baseball, huge bounce back. Get on your knees, Gators. Beck for mercy. Wake Up War Champ presented by Corner Pocket Bar and Grill. cptallybar.com website. Yep, that's right. 2475 Appalachian Parkway. Physical address. Trivia night went down last night. I hope you folks had fun getting crushed by Corey Clark's team. Hope you enjoyed the tacos as well. Go over there today for lunch, everybody, from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. and get five chicken wings and french fries for only $8.99. Best chicken wings in town. Do we know yet, Corey, if we can go all flats? Can we Can we make the the ask? Will, it, will they charge us extra? Or if, if we tell them that we're with War Chant, they might just go ahead and let it ride. Oh, yeah. No, you can do all flats. They're uh, they're used to it from uh, from me anyway. That's the only chicken wing I ever or, uh, eat anymore, Aslan. Okay. All right. We'll do that. Only eight ninety nine of the Corner Pocket Bar and Grill, Tallahassee, Florida. Don't forget tomorrow, bingo night, 7 o'clock sharp. Get over there. Win some money. Have some fun. Meet some cool people. You can meet cool people as well on the internet over at wordchant.com. Our message board's always busy and active. Subscribe. You can look at our forums, get involved, but you can also read everybody else's forums. You can read the Gators crying about getting run ruled by the Knowles last night in Jacksonville. Let's go. Or the fact that Miami's never going to be back. Enjoy all these things at warchant.com, the ultimate symbol sports source. Five-star rating and review. Thumbs up, please, as well. Hey, course, shout out to our guy, Grumpy BK, loyal listener. Uh, he chimed in, so I just feel like I, I should give him some some platform time here because he listened to us uh, talk 13, 14 minutes about the whole receivers, distribution, targets. He feels like this year's roster, Corey, is going to produce results similar to 2012. No clear cut number one. Uh, that team went 10 and 2, won the ACC, ended ranked 10th. Uh, we'll make the playoffs, but we probably don't win it. Uh, so he says, you know, EJ had 3,400 passing yards, 23 passing touchdowns, 10 picks, 300 rushing yards, four touchdowns. I think, I, I think that's what he's saying, or maybe that's what he's projecting DJ is going to have. But I guess he compares Devontae to Roy Dell, Chris Thompson to Toa Feely, James Wilder to either Kazire, Cam Davis, obviously EJ to DJ. Rashad Green, uh, Malik Benson will be playing that role. 60 ball, 700 yards. Hakeem playing the role of Kelvin, 30 for 500. Ja'Kai will be playing the role of Tushaw, Kenny Raw, 30 and 500. Rodney Smith, maybe the portier guy. Nick O'Leary, uh, 2012 Nick O'Leary production from Kyle Morlock. I'll take all that, I think, yeah? Oh, yeah, 100%. Those are those are all very good players. Uh, I, don't, I think that team threw the ball a little more than uh... – or they rode Chris Thompson a lot too until he got hurt. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I, can, I guess I could see some similarity. I, I just think that, I guess the 2012 team had Greg Dent too, who was a who was who mm. had a lot or uh, at least a few catches that year. I just think this wide receiver rotation is a little deeper than that one. Certainly not better. I'm not saying they're better than Rashad and Kelvin and Kenny Shaw, but I do think there's more options uh, in this in this wide receiver room than uh, than the 2012 one. All right. Well, wide receivers, uh, maybe a little bit of an uprising yesterday at practice. Mm-hmm. Nothing going on today. Scrimmage on Thursday. We don't get to watch it, but we get to speak to everybody coaching wise afterwards. So uh, let's dive into this core. If we can maybe just talk about uh, period three and just some one on one stuff before we dive into the seven on seven and the 11 on 11 and leave, a, leave some ambigu- ambiguity uh, so people don't um, tune out too fastly. Uh, but what did you think about period three? I think a lot of people might get some uh, conflicting information on on a touchdown to Darion Williamson. From my vantage point, Josh Storms reacted with a very like, oh, man, that was so close. He didn't complete the catch. And I saw Mike Norvell screaming down and waving his hands like incomplete, incomplete. But it, it looked like a catch to me. And I think a lot of people react like it was a touchdown. Uh, but I had a, 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 a drop, tough drop, tough, tough, would have been a tough catch, but I, I listed as a drop. Otherwise, man, that period three, they, they went red zone, right? Corey, they were, I don't know, maybe the 10, 15 yard line. Maybe no, it was, range. it was just straight. Uh, it was two point conversions. Okay. I was two point. All right. Yeah. All right. It was just six straight two point conversion plays. Offense did pretty good, huh, Corey? 
Yeah, they did all. They they got them all except for the one you just mentioned, where it was a it was an almost catch, yep. and then they they finished with five straight conversions, including a really nice catch from Deuce Span, who had a nice practice um, in the corner of the end zone, um, kind of a one handed grab from uh, DJ. Just a, a really pretty. The whole play was pretty. Like Earl Little had good coverage. It was just a better throw and a really good catch from Deuce. And I thought that was kind of how most of the practice was, Aslan. I thought – and it was all different guys. Like, Hakeem had a catch in that drill for a, for a two-point conversion. Malik, uh, Morlock, I think, Ja'Kai, and then the one I just talked about was Span. Yep. That kind of goes to show you I just keep naming names. And I yeah. didn't even name Destin Hill. I didn't name uh, Jalen Brown, did you ja- say Malik, downtown Brown. Did you say Malik Benson? I did say I, – okay. I meant to if I didn't. Okay. But, yeah, Malik Benson was in there. He caught one of the balls. Um so, yeah, man, there's just a lot of depth there, a lot of good depth. And um, it kind of went on for the rest of practice, too. The defense had its moments, too, uh, including a couple of interceptions, some PBUs. But overall, man, you just – again, I was – I wrote about it on the site. Like, I, you, you just get kind of struck, at least I did, Thursday or Tuesday more than any other day, just about the rise in roster talent and depth in which – Look, man, I don't expect Lewayne McCoy to play a lot this year, but he's a darn good receiver. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is a true freshman in his first spring, and he makes one or two eye-opening plays every practice. And I don't expect him to get on the field, not because he's not going to be really good. He might be awesome at Florida State, but there's a lot of older guys that are pretty darn good too ahead of him. So uh, you just you just see – I thought Brock Glenn had a really good day, and I don't expect him to be on the field. <laughs> unless something, unless DJ gets hurt, you know what I mean. Like I just think the the floor has been raised to the point where the backups, it could get to the point if they're good enough again, where you look forward to seeing the backups play and what they could do with their time. Because I do think that uh, these backups, this will be the best. The, this will be, I think, probably the best second string that Norvell has ever had. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I kind of was trying to ask him that after practice because, you know. I think we all assume DJ is going to start in Ireland. I think that's a very safe assumption, but it's still a competition. I feel like, like I, Brock Glenn is, is, is bringing it to like, he's not shrinking in the moment here, but, but I, I think over a long enough timeline here, DJ kind of takes over, but for so many years, man, like watching Drew Weatherford and Xavier Lee or, you know, Deandre and James Blackman, like whenever there was these like legitimate, legitimate quarterback sort of competitions, controversy, whatever you want to call them you'd always kind of shelve it or table it with like, well, hey, you know, he ran with the ones today and, you know, he had a better completion percentage because he ran with the ones. Uh, and then, like, things would flip when the other quarterback would get to run with maybe the more talented wide receiving core. There doesn't feel like there is any drop-off. And, and listen, I don't know if they're going to be as good as a, the 23 receiving core, right? Like, I don't know if they're going to be as productive or as right. dynamic as, like, you know, Keon and Johnny. But, man, when, when DJ's in there and then Brock comes in, there, there's no drop off in who they're throwing the football to, and again, I don't know. Hopefully, those guys will level up as well, um, because they, you don't want them to stagnate to where they're at right now. But if those guys get better, man, then which we think they will, the receivers I'm talking about, they're in a really good position, uh, just flush with talent. Yeah, and I think you look at, um, and again, it just struck me on Tuesday watching it. Like, I obviously I don't think whoever the starting running back is is going to be better than Trey Benson or as good as Trey Benson. I don't think whoever the defensive end opposite Patrick Payton is is going to be Jared Verse. But I do think the the and we talked about this on headlines a little bit on Tuesday, that there will be not there won't be this chasm between when your when your starting defensive ends go off the field and you replace them with other players, it won't be that chasm, that huge disparity that I thought in my mind uh affected the twenty twenty three Florida State team. Now, look, they were still undefeated. So they, they withstood it. They were still very, very good on that side of the ball. But I just think when you look at the defensive end position, the defensive tackle position, wide receiver, like you mentioned, maybe the ta- the, fir- the starters aren't quite as good, aren't as good as what you had last year at certain positions. But the depth and the backups are so much better, in my opinion, that it it's not quite a wash. You don't lose Jared Verse, and then you're like, ah, who cares? You just keep, keep going. You, that, you're going to take a hit. But the, like we talked about, the combination of these defensive ends, you might still have a better defensive end room this year coming up in totality than you did last year, even without verse. 
if Peyton takes that next step, if Marvin is as good as we think he can be, if Lola Haya continues to look like this, and then Byron Turner overdrive or somebody else makes a big jump, um, you know, I just I, – I don't think I, – I think the depth for the second stringers, which helps everything. I, I do want to put that into context too. Like people might think, well, why does it matter if your second string is good? If you stay healthy, they're not going to play a lot. Well, number one, they will. Second stringers play a lot. You're not going to stay healthy. Uh, but that's just football, but also the competition it breeds in practice where if Malik Benson is working against the second team secondary or maybe a better, if Azaria Thomas is working against the second string quote-unquote receiver, he can't just bully the kid into submission because he's just so much better than him. He can get burned by that kid too. Like just the, competi- the competition to be a starter is higher than it's ever been, but also just the competition between ones versus twos on opposite sides. It's never been like this, I don't think. I, that just struck me a lot. I keep saying that. Yeah. But it really did strike me on uh, um, on Tuesday how much that floor has been raised to where these practices are so highly competitive. They just are, man. They just are. And Brock Glenn helps too now. You mentioned him. He's not giving up anything. He's, he's, he's there to compete. Um, he is he is bringing it every day. He has not quite you know you know gone quietly into that good night and just said I'm going to be the second stringer or whatever. He's fighting now. He probably almost certainly will be the second stringer, but he's pushing DJ and he's also giving all these other guys valuable reps because he's been a good quarterback through four days, which gives all these gives the receivers valuable reps and the defense having to go against them valuable reps too. You know, what struck me on Tuesday was. What was the movie, Honey? Honey, I Shrunk the Kids. Mm, yeah, with Feel Rick like... Moranis, the great Rick Moranis. <laughs> Indeed, absolutely. Can't name anybody else that was in that movie, though. I can't either. Um, I can't remember. I don't even know who the wife was. I don't know either. I'll look that up. But it struck me as like, dude, we shrunk the running back, kind of like. I asked. I don't know if I asked you. I think I asked you. I'm like, who's three? Yeah, like the running back. And you're like, it's it's the freshman, Cam Davis. I'm like, he looks like. Trey Benson, but just maybe like and just was put in a compactor and lost a few inches. Like he was shrunk down a little bit. But in terms of like burst and the physical kind of edge, he's going to be fun. I I think he's going to be part of uh, the mix too. Again, I don't know if the ceiling is going to be Trey Benson. I'm not saying, actually, I know it's probably not going to be the ceiling of Trey Benson, but like the floor. I like how you mentioned that because I, th- I think that's where things are because when you roll out Roydell and you roll out Cam Davis and you roll out Toa Feely and you roll out Kaziah, you know, I think you might be in a better place than you were last year with, you know, Rodney Hill and, and Kaziah kind of trying to find his legs a little bit. So, uh, well, that, don't forget Toa Feely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, it, yeah I, I don't know because the combination of Toa Feely and Benson was pretty darn good. And I don't know the combination of Toa Feely and whoever is, is going to live up to that. But again, I think you're – you know, Kaziah can play. I don't think they're going to lose a whole lot. I, they are right. losing a home run hitter. But I think this offense has other home run hitters that last year's offense didn't to make up for it. Hmm. Like, that that's just – I mean, Benson was their big play guy last year. You lost him. But I think now your big play guys are going to be out wide or, in the case of Jalen Lucas, a little bit of everything. Uh, but – Overall, I think the running back room will be fine. Toa Feely's a big-time player. He's a, I shouldn't say big-time. He is a very good college running back. Um, he's not Barry Sanders or Adrian Peterson, but he's a very good college running back. And uh, you almost forget about him because he's just been here so long, and he's just part of the deal. He's just part of the program now. But he's going to be a a, a, a huge part of this offense. But, you know, I, I, is he a home run threat? I, I mean, I guess he's had big – 70-yard touchdowns. He obviously had the long run against Louisville, uh, but he's had other wheel route touchdowns and stuff. I just think that overall, I wouldn't go as far to say the running back room will be as good or you're not going to miss a beat when you lose somebody like Trey Benson, but the totality of the playmakers on offense, there's just more of them than there was last year. Let's go to one-on-ones, Corey. Uh, okay. The first one that I looked up and saw was Brock Glenn taking a shot deep downfield to Ja'Kai, who was covered by... Azarie and, and Jakai coming down with the catch. Uh, that might have been the, the best connection out there. I, th- I thought there was a really good route ran by uh, Hakeem. He was getting grabbied by Greedy Vance. He was getting all sorts of jammed up, but was able to, to go up and catch the ball that was thrown by DJ Uwe Ungalale. And you told me to, to, to look and, and pay attention to number six, Jalen Brown, the LSU transfer. And I'm like, all right, I, I'll try to. Man, he had, he had two plays in the one-on-ones. 
one of them was a throw from Luke Cromanhawk that that I don't know if Luke underthrew him or just by his sure his sheer smoothness and effortless yeah. running ability. Look, he he almost like overran it, um, but he he slowed up and he made a catch and it, it was a walk on, but still just the the body control, correct awareness. It doesn't even matter who. I mean, it does matter yeah. who the opponent was, but what what you're looking at and you saw it perfectly. It's the body control. It's running full speed stopping on a dime and also high pointing it mm. that was a re- that was really impressive he's he again he's he's been an impressive guy the last couple practices and then there was a second rep that he ran in one on ones where yeah. he did a double move and the the cornerback who was another different walk on was on him the entire time like i was i was really impressed but after like the second move of the double move he put the brakes on and just i don't even think he touched the defensive back, but just by the sheer way that he, so on a double move, like you run, you stop, and then you start accelerating again. Well, when he stopped again for the second time, the DB just, it looked like there was a force field around Jalen Brown that just propelled him away from him. Just, the, the, I don't mean, just, I guess that's the way he just runs routes are just so crisp in the, in the way he's able just to, you know, chop his feet and stop on a dime uh, was really impressive. So he had, uh, two big catches uh, in one on one, so that that was nice to see because he's somebody that I have not nearly talked enough about. Again, only four days, but you you saw that early on, so tip my cap. Did you to mention? You. Uh, did you mention Destin? I did not. No, tell me so about Destin. So the the first two plays that I saw in one on ones were the very first one they ran was Destin, basically on a go hmm. against Jabril Rawls, uh, true uh, red redshirt freshman corner. A scholarship guy and Destin Hill just sprinted right past him because Destin Hill is really fast and Brock Glenn dropped in about a 50 or 60 yard throw that would have been a 95 yard touchdown because he wasn't going to catch Destin. Then two two reps later, Ja'Kai Douglas does the exact same thing to Azaria Thomas, the exact same thing, the exact same throw, the exact same catch, and Azaria is really good and has been good. It was good on Tuesday aside from this play. Um, again, Ja'Kai is almost like the toophilia of the receivers. <laughs> you just forget he's around until he goes and does something like he did on Tuesday. He also made a great touchdown catch in 7-on-7, seven seven, uh, like a really contested kind of back shoulderish catch against Earl Little. Um, that He just goes and makes plays, man. And he's a forgotten guy, kind of. Not forgotten, just by me. I should just speak for myself. He's a guy. He's a taken-for-granted guy. He's just out there doing what he does. Um, so, and... I just I always think it's telling that um, the shots downfield are so much more yeah. than they've been. And I asked Lil Ravel about it uh, on Tuesday, just about if you tweak the offense because of the speed and what you have out wide compared to last year. And he, you know, he said you're all you always want to coach with speed. He goes, I've had teams that have had a lot of speed before, and those are usually fun offenses to be a part of um, because you can tell. I think it's just a part of the plan. Mm-hmm. is they aren't going to have these speed guys just running six-yard hitches. They are going to try to blow the top off a of defense a lot, and they got the guys that can do it because in one-on-ones, I think they completed four ca- – this is just abnormal. I want you to give people the context of this too. They had, I think, four catches of at least 45 to 50 yards in one-on-ones. It was fun. It was yeah. fun, Corey. It was like but an that's not what happens a lot, right? Yeah, they don't. No. They don't typically do that. We've watched how many of these Norvell practices? A hundred. Right. I've never seen that many deep shots completed in one on ones that that we saw on Tuesday by a bunch of by you know four different guys. Yeah. Uh, just to add, wrap up things from my side of things on the one on ones, Corey. Uh, you know. Maybe don't get all that excited about Brian Corden, but he's still out there competing at tight end. Yeah. He he cooked one of the defensive backs that they're probably going to rely on heavily. Great move. It was brilliant. It was really Jeff nice. Cameron. I was standing next to Cameron when he did. He's like, oh, man, wow. Because yeah. yeah. uh, I was looking down, typing something in my phone, and he's like, oh, Brian Courtney just made a heck of a move. Yeah. That was a really good route. That was a great route. And I'm like, all right, all right. Uh, Luke Cromanhawk had a nice deep connection to do span. We'll talk about yeah. him a little bit later on. And uh, Ashlyn Barker, defense didn't go quietly into the night. I don't know if he he jumped the route. I don't know if he picked it off or not. He didn't. But, he batted it down. Yeah. So he did get an interception later on in practice, though. Hmm. Uh, to close out the entire practice was right. a uh, an eleven on eleven near the in the red zone. Maybe the ball was at the eight or ten or twelve, something like that. He intercepted one in the corner of the end zone off Cromanhawk. Really nice play. Really nice break on the ball to leap to high point and then get his feet down. So he missed an interception earlier. It's good to see him come back and make that play. Also, 
what's cool again, what's so cool about this team so far through four practices is Azaria gives up that long pass to Jakai. The very next rep they have is the same guys against each other. Azaria is in his hip pocket the whole time, bats it down for a PBU, almost gets a pick. That's competition. Yeah, That's what it breeds. You want to see those guys that bounce back like that. We know Azaria is really good, but it's still good to see that kind of stuff um, from all these guys. If they have a bad rep, they come right back and have a good one. We'll get back to practice observations, but did want to talk about the comments from Coach Norvell after practice in terms of injuries. Uh, so we, we can talk about these openly and freely now that the coaches revealed it to everybody. But Robert Scott and Joshua Farmer, they're both going to be out for the entire spring yeah. Uh, but they're expected to be ready to go either when off-season program starts up or at least for preseason camp. He said, I mean, he was pretty specific to say summer workouts. Summer workouts, okay, yeah. thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, Jamari Howard, that was a guy that looked really good in day one and just moved around really well. I'm like, all right, this guy's going to be a fun you know, sort of product to see how he's able to develop. He unfortunately uh, sustained an injury at some point uh, during practice here, and he, too, will miss the entire spring, but unfortunately it sounds like his rehabilitation is is going to cut into the regular season as well. We don't have a, a firm timeline on that, but uh, Norvell did sound um, a little bit more concerned about his availability because it's obviously going to cut into the season. But again, Scott Farmer. Uh, so if you ask us about how they're looking, we can actually tell you now uh, they're not practicing because they're uh, healing up and, and dealing with whatever they're dealing with that we're not going to specify, but... Uh, I will say, I mean, I don't know, can I say, like, Robert Scott's out there, out there. I haven't seen Josh Farmer. I've seen him. Yeah, okay, he's out right. there. I saw. I stood behind him today. I had to move oh. around because I couldn't see what was going on on the field. Yeah, he's out there. Large human being. They play so much football, though, Corey, not a really big deal, I, I would yeah, assume, no. right? No, I mean, it would be good to get your O-line, some, your starting O-line some reps, but really, do you need them in March? I mean, all those guys, Robert Scott's played 100 games. Um, well, probably not that many. But I would guess literally probably 45 games of college football. Um, all those guys, you know, a lot of those guys have Byers, Washington, Maurice, and him. So, no, I don't think it's the end of the world if he misses if he misses spring, especially if it gets him right, like really right uh, for this season because he was not right at all last season. It would be nice for him to be fully healthy, and let's see how that impacts the entire starting line if you have a, a healthy and good Robert Scott at left tackle. He's played 2,082 snaps. Golly. That's a lot. It is. That is a lot. Vitaminenergy.com, promo code WordChamp BOGO, WordChamp B-O-G-O. Buy one item, get one free. I was on a different nutrition and supplement website the other day and, and had a BOGO code heavily promoted on their website. I'm like, oh, cool. Let me do that. I'll order some protein. But it was buy one, get one 50% off. Boo. Vitamin Energy don't do you dirty like that. Buy one, get one free with the promo code WarChamp BOGO. WarChamp B-O-G-O. Vitamin Energy with benefits. Vitamins and nutrients. 260 milligrams of all natural caffeine. Powering you through the day and improving your mood. Improving your focus. All these sorts of things. Clinically proven. Clinically tested. After seven days of use, folks in this trial said that the shot significantly improved their energy levels, lowered their fatigue, lower their brain fog, improve their mood, and help with their problems with focus and concentration. After seven days of using the vitamin energy shots, 85.7% of the participants agreed that vitamin energy shots were effective at boosting their energy. Seven days after that, 14 days in total of this trial, 89.3% of the participants agreed that the vitamin energy shots are effective at boosting their energy. Clinically tested, clinically proven, buy one, get one free. What are you waiting for? Vitaminenergy.com. All right, let's pick it back up then, Corey. Seven on seven. Uh, this was kind of the, the start of the defense coming maybe out of their shell, walking a little bit taller. It felt like defense uh, seemed to be, at least in the, the part where they were near midfield, so there was a lot more leverage behind them. They went to a seven on seven in the red zone on the 15-yard line. We can get to here in a minute or two. Uh, but when they went to seven on seven, that's kind of it, it felt like the defense started to find their footing and, and competing a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, Azaria on the very first play almost had an interception to Brock Glenn, like made a great break on the ball. I think it was to Portier, maybe Williamson, uh, one of the vets. It was really good coverage, and he locked him up and almost had an interception just doing what he does. Um, and, yeah, I'm looking at my notes. Uh, oh, the the biggest play, the best play was Justin Cryer yeah. uh, with, with what amounted to a pick six. Yeah, man. With really good coverage on Toa Feely and what would have been a pick six. We talked about DJ – not checking down a lot. He actually tried to take it that time. And uh, Justin Cryer said, no, no, not today, buddy. No. 
That might have worked in uh, Corvallis. That's not working down here in Tallahassee. So that was cool to see that. Uh, uh, and they had, you know, the offense had some good moments too. But yeah, by DJ, and large, yeah, DJ had a good throw to Malik Benson, uh, and then he also had a good throw to uh, Hakeem. I thought in that seven on yeah, seven. Yeah, back to back. Yeah, yeah, he had back to back where he he completed one. He completed two to Hakeem for about forty yards total, and then another one to Malik Benson for twelve yards. So in one stretch, he was three for three for about fifty-two yards. Really good plays, and he hit Destin. The play right before that is again something that I was telling Jeff when we were watching it. Right before the pick six that that Cryer had. It's one of those where they're not open right, right away. Nobody's open right away. And I've watched all these Norvell practices where if the if the guys aren't open right away, if you're doing the quarterback clock in your head, you're like, okay, well, it's been five seconds. I wouldn't still be looking downfield. I'm just going to put the ball under my arm and jog towards the line of scrimmage. They'll blow the play dead. That's how it's been going on for since we've been watching Norvell practices with Jordan Travis and you know uh, A.J. Duffy, Rodemaker, whoever. Well, D.J. doesn't do that. When they're not open right away, he, he kind of moves a little bit to his right or left or whatever he's doing, but he's still looking downfield. He's still looking downfield, and then it gives these receivers a chance to practice the scramble drill. And so he had Destin Hill on like a 17-yard gain, well at like seven seconds after the ball had been snapped. That's a interminable amount of time. But DJ Ui Ungagale moves well. Mm. It is hard to bring down, and there will be plays throughout the course of a season where he does break containment, and he is all alone on the right side of the field, and he is still looking downfield, and instead of running for eight yards, he might be able to hit a 50-yard throw if the receivers learn to work with him on these scramble drills. And so I just think that's a, a nice little wrinkle they've added. Uh, or maybe, they, again, I don't even know if they've added it. I meant to ask Norvell, and I, and I forgot to. I don't know if they've added it, or DJ just does that. Yeah. But I really think it's good because Destin Hill hasn't played a lot of college football. And it's good for him to get on the same page and learn how to do a scramble drill. And he made a really nice throw to Destin right there, right before the, uh, you know, obviously right before the pick six. Yeah. All right, let's move to the, the seven on seven part where they were on the 15 yard line. I thought each quarterback had a really great throw. Uh, Brock's first throw was to Ja'Kai uh, for a touchdown. Uh, Luke Cromenhawk, his final throw, I think the final throw of that period where, again, seven on seven, 15 yard line going into the end zone. Uh, I don't know. I think it was it was a really good throw. Even better catch. Jalen Brown, I think, was sliding on his knees, yeah, uh, catching it at the front pylon in the corner, and that was a really good way to end that period and, and really got uh, Norvell excited. But I, I thought maybe the best throw I think of the entire day was DJ's touchdown pass in that seven on seven period where they're on the fifteen yard line. To where, Feely, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. Yeah, I'll let Corey great. color a little bit better, but I mean, Toefield was bracketed. There was a guy underneath, there was a guy up, up top, and DJ just showed the right amount of touch and, and pace and fitted it perfectly. And then that, to me, was the best throw of the day. Oh, it absolutely was. Yeah, no, 100%. Yeah, that was. there's no doubt about it. It was. Uh, he was not open. He was not, I mean, it wasn't a bad decision, but you have to put it in a, it was a tight window throw. And, you know, Toefield is a great pass catcher for a running back, but that's a tight throw, and it's a perfect throw. And it's just the confidence he threw it with, the the timing, the rhythm. It, yeah, correct. That was the, I thought that was the best throw anybody made probably the whole day. Yeah. Let's go to 11-on-11 11 11, um, when they were closing things down during practice. Um, real quick aside here, we have seen Adam Fuller and, and Mike Norvell with walkie-talkies in their hand. Not headsets, mm. but rather walkie-talkies. And I've wondered aloud, I wonder if that's them communicating to the quarterbacks or the whoever's got the green dot, whoever's got the... Uh, headset or the microphone or the speaker speaker I'm sorry the speaker inside their helmet and it's definitely them communicating on those things Corey there was a play in this 11 on 11 period where Croman Hawk I think it was Croman Hawk threw the ball away and as soon as you know he throws the ball away the defense is celebrating because they get a stop but I, I could hear Norvell who's right next to me on this walkie-talkie being like great decision that was a great decision and he starts talking to him about mm, okay. you know the next play to get ready for so that, that I mean, that's pretty cool right because you know, you can look over to the sideline during a game and, and maybe get like a head nod or a clap, like, hey, man, you're good, you're good. But probably like to hear him tell you as soon as a play is over, like, hey, man, like, good job on that one or, hey, you missed this part of it. That's that's going to be a really interesting thing to see how it plays out through the course of the season because you feel like this coaching staff is so well organi organized and so talented that this just gives them like another edge to sharpen and hone their play calling and, and everything they do. So uh, I, I just... You know, want to kind of add that to, to the conversation. And I don't even think – the play calling is one thing. I still think most of their play calling will be the guys on the sidelines holding up signs. Yeah. 
It's but you will you are able to communicate with your quarterback, and there there are going to be head coaches or play callers. They're going to have to like put a governor on themselves. Like, don't talk too much. <laughs> right, right, right. Don't be like, uh, like the because F1 I know stuff. how I would be. I would be like, man, that's a really good decision. You made a really nice decision there, but golly, that last throw before that, I still can't get over. What were you thinking? <laughs> like, I you would always you you got to like just be in the moment. Don't criticize or praise too much because you've got to get to the play, and then maybe one little like, uh, hey, and watch the safety on this. But even that could be too much information. Yeah. Like you don't want to fill their head like, hey, look at that corner blitz now. We've talked about it because then all of a sudden he's looking for the corner blitz and you're in his head too much. So that communication right before the snap with a 19-year-old or – you know, I know DJ's older than that. I'm thinking down the line like next year. No. Um, cause you like Bill Self, you, you Bill Self over here? You're just worrying about next season already? Right, exactly right. No, yeah, exactly. I'm thinking about like DJ's – you know, he's 23 years old probably – but, you know, the NFL quarterbacks that deal with their coaches in their ears all the time are, are men. But, you know, whoever's the quarterback next year probably hasn't dealt with that a lot. You just want to – you don't want to give them too much to think about and criticize too much or praise too much. You kind of just want, I think, just to be the communication about the next play. Like what you said, good job, good decision. Now here, let's do this. Yeah. But not – don't fill them too much with, okay, now it's, it's third and eight, so expect pressure up the middle – um, I mean, I guess that's the right way to do it, but what if they don't bring pressure up the middle? Yeah, anyway, that's. No. Uh, I just think well, that's something. They're all gonna. All these coaches are gonna have to police themselves because they're gonna want to talk so much. Yeah. So to the eleven eleven period observations now. First drive was DJ Uyunglele uh, at the helm. Yep. That was a really nice drive. Uh, the, the first two plays, uh, Jalen Lucas is yep. just electric everybody and yep. i think you and tom had a good conversation about while we were waiting to talk to norvell there's gonna be some limitations everybody he's not gonna catch he's not gonna get 70 targets uh, he's not gonna catch 45 passes he's, he's you know he's not gonna be running down the sideline the catch the, radius yes isn't enormous folks but the staff is so creative in, in how they draw things up that they'll find ways to get him the football and when they do in space man it's it's lights out it, like scoreboards changing or at least the the down markers changing at an absolute minimum. So yeah, uh, first play in eleven on eleven DJ to him uh, was a really nice uh, forty. I, I had it for forty yards. That sounds about right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and then next play after that, that was probably the, the biggest, uh, the biggest run. Probably not. Probably it was the biggest run of the day. No, Corey uh, to Zion yeah, yeah. Holmes. Uh, Samuel Singleton had uh, a couple of nice runs. He had a forty yarder in the early eleven on eleven, and then I think he had a twenty five yarder later in this section. But yeah, this was Kazaya um, from forty two yards out, touchdown run uh, down the block really well. Um, and then Shaheem, who had who had been able to catch or not catch, but angle out Lucas, didn't have the angle for this one. And Kazaya can move, man. Hmm. Shaheem's fast. He was fast enough to angle out Jalen Lucas on one play. He's probably tired because the very next play he's having to do it again. But Kazai is fast enough to get by uh, the safety and get in the end zone. So, yeah, that was a that was a really impressive back-to-back plays for the offense. Uh, otherwise, I had uh, a good throw from Brock Glenn to Malik Benson and also a, a nice yeah. play design uh, that he hooked up with, with Kyle Morlock in that 11-on-11 yeah. 11 period. Yep, that about uh, and I in the two on defense that I that I noticed out of that period, other than the Barker interception that we already mentioned, was uh, uh, Blake Nicholson got an interception on a pass that was deflected at the line by heavy pressure, but I could not see which defensive lineman got him. I'm gonna guess it was Peyton, just because all he does is bat balls, but I didn't. I don't know that for sure. It could have been Marvin, but I know like two plays later. Uh, well, the next play, Daryl Jackson just wrecked a running play. And then the very next play, he got a sack by wrecking the interior of the Florida State offensive line. Like, I can't remember the quarterback was. It was either Glenn or Cromanock. They had no time to throw because the guard was in their lap mm. because Daryl Jackson is a man-child out there. Yeah, and then wrapping it up, just the only other, like, lone observation to add. I just, you know, Sean Murphy, I, I again, when I saw him at tour of duty, to me, he just seemed like like a, a bygone player, like a relic, like this, this kind of body type and, and, you know, movement doesn't seem to be what you see out of linebackers. And I don't know where he would fit in, but I think this is like two days now where I've seen him diagnose screen plays and yeah. just gobble up much smaller, much faster guys in wide open space. So yeah, that was a cool thud, the one he had on Tuesday. And then DJ Lundy had one on Luke, our man Lucas yeah. 
out in the flat. Had a really good read on that. Yeah, that was uh, that was good to see because those are big dudes having to guard not big dudes, very quick guys. And on those particular plays, anyway, uh, Murphy and Lundy both had uh, you know exceptional hits, contact. Uh, you know, they're not they're not bringing these guys to the ground necessarily, but it is it is thudding with an intent, an impact, and uh, both of them were impressive on those two plays anyway. MyBookie.ag, promo code WordChant. That's it, it's WordChant. Instant cash deposit bonus. Tomorrow we're back at it, everybody. The tournament starting back up, Sweet 16 style. Only two lines I see of right now, first half lines. Arizona favored by four over Clemson. And San Diego State getting six and a half against UConn. Man, San Diego State makes things kind of muddy, kind of gross. I don't know, though, man. I like UConn a lot. I think I'll go ahead and say that UConn will be up by at least seven at half. And I think Clemson will be within four at half against Arizona. Make your picks. Go to mybookie.ag. When you sign for the first time, use the promo code WARCHANT. Get that instant cash deposit bonus. Promo does require a $50 minimum deposit and rollover requirement of one-time deposit total, including bonus for withdrawal. For full terms and conditions, visit mybookie.ag. Slash about dash us. All right, man. Let's let's talk baseball, Corey. All right. I I, I don't think it could have been any better. Um, I I don't think a fourteen to zero win would have been any better for Florida State. Uh, the fourteen to three final over Florida in Jacksonville. You're the visiting team, so you get top of the innings. Uh, first inning, Florida State comes out strong. Cam Smith, James Tibbs, Jaime Ferrer, back to back to back, one out singles, and then Daniel Cantu, a guy that you've been talking about really excited about what he can be and I I, I don't want to say I've, I haven't been high on him I just I probably haven't given him enough uh, you know spotlight that he certainly deserves after what he did on Tuesday night but he hits a, a bases clearing double so Florida State jumps out to a 3-0 lead and then the bottom half of the inning starts and the Gators lead off batter walks second batter gets a single Caglione hits a three-run home run, and just like that, you're tied up, and you've got no outs. Andrew Armstrong starts the game, and you're like, this is a bullpen sort of night sort of game. This is going to get ugly. It's going to be a just an absolute 14-13 final, and hopefully you, you can hang on and find a way. But that's not the way it played out. Florida State, their offense elite in every aspect, absolutely shown. Uh, on Tuesday night in Jacksonville. And then this bullpen, this much maligned bullpen, shout out to my God, John a- a- Abraham, mm-hmm. took up for you. Yep. I mean, yep. three and one third innings, uh, no hits, no runs, five strikeouts. The If you were watching this on the SEC Network Plus, everybody, uh, we were treated to the, the Florida Gator radio announcing team, and they were so salty about John Abraham throwing all these breaking pitches. It's like, he's going to throw his arm out if he keeps doing this. Well, he did it all night long, and... Uh, kept the Gators off the board, and then Brennan Oxford came in, and he he needs to be your left-handed guy that you can rely on. He he goes one and two thirds the rest of the way to finish it off. Joe Charles gets credited with the win, uh, you know. And no point uh, were they in, in in I guess jeopardy, obviously here, Corey, fourteen to three, but and they mercy rule it. So I would like to see them get twenty-seven full outs, but to to get punched in the nose that quickly in that sort of fashion in the first inning, but just to slam the door, does that give you a, a good sense of confidence, or at least? what the culture, the makeup of this team is? So, you know, and we talked about it earlier in the week, Aslan. It's not like the bullpen hadn't had success. They had just been the bigger, the biggest reason that Florida State had won the previous four games. You know, the three against Notre Dame where the offense on Saturday and Sunday scored four runs and four runs. They won both of those games. And then the Tuesday game, they won one to nothing with a bullpen game. They didn't even have a starting pitcher. So we knew the bullpen had had its moments. But then what I wondered about after such a horrific beating in Clemson, like that, that baseball is such a mental game. And how are you going to bounce back from those kind of outings? And I know we're talking about basically three guys, but Oxford, Abraham and Charles were all part of those meltdowns. Mm -hmm. And so you just wondered how the team would respond after just a a diabolical way to lose a series. I mean, it was just nuts that that happened, that you blew an 8-1 lead in a ninth inning, and then the next game blew an 11-2 lead in the sixth inning. To come back and play another top-10 team away from home, I know it's a neutral site game, but away from home, and then you immediately give up a three-run homer for them to tie the game, and you're like, well, here we go again. And then, nope, Charles, Abraham, and Oxford, I just looked it up, they they pitched seven innings and allowed one hit (laughs) – and struck out 11 
in seven innings. Man, that just said. I just think that says something. Uh, certainly, Against maybe the, about the makeup of those guys, no. but the, but maybe just the makeup of the team itself that they can go out there after humiliating efforts the for the previous two games to go out there and beat a, a good Florida team in run rule fashion hmm. and just bludgeon their pitchers to death uh, is that was just a, that's that's just really impressive, man. It's one game, I get it. Baseball's fifty four games, but man, that's really impressive for them to bounce back like that. Well, against a, a Florida team that just beat the defending national champions in Baton Rouge and run ruled them in one of those wins. Right. Uh, absolutely huge bounce back. I, we're going to get to talk to Link later today, so check out WarChant.com and check out our YouTube page. We'll have that full interview up. But really curious to hear him talk about uh, you know, what he thinks he might have gained or learned from his team because I, I it, it is one game, but just to, to start off that shaky again and – you know, just say, no, it, it's not going to be like this again. Uh, it, it's really super impressive. Again, this offense is nuts. Uh, Cantu was three for four with five ribbies. Ferro two for five. Uh, both those were home runs, five RBIs as well. Max Williams had an RBI. Cam Smith had an RBI. James Hibbs had an RBI. Din just had an RBI. Uh, this offense is fantastic. If the bullpen can firm up, which I, I think they will. Again, I, I'm really confident they will. Oh, this is a really exciting team to think about their future, man. And they get, what, Louisville this week in a weird... Louisville mid- Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, a, another game without an error. Um, now, there were 13 strikeouts, but of the 11 other outs, not an error. Of the balls that were put in play, they didn't make an error. Um, what, they have three doubles and three home runs. They just slug- They struck out three times as an offense. With that slugging, with all those hits, with all those power bats, they still only struck out three times. Even their outs are loud outs. I think their last out they made was a fly out to the track and right. Um, Jackson West had a nice game, and he's not even the everyday catcher. Uh, yeah, man, it's just we know what the offense is, and I think we know what the defense is. And now, weirdly, I kind of think we know what the makeup of the team is. And I and we talk, I think maybe it was on headlines. On my podcast, they run together, Aslan. Um, <laughs> but we, I, was in, I was actually encouraged by how they bounced back over the weekend, despite the end results of those games. Because when you lose your first game in run-rule variety, in run-rule fashion, to then come back and have an 8-1 lead in the ninth inning the next day against the number four team in the country on the road, I feel like that says a lot about the talent, but the mental makeup. Now, obviously, the bullpen imploded. Even after that horrific loss, one of the worst regular season losses you could ever possibly see, the next day, they're up 11-2 to again. Like, they're just, it seems to me, and I know the bullpen melted down again, but the offense is relentless. Yes. Um, and it, and I feel like the mental makeup of the team is pretty darn impressive. Just throw strikes, as, as Jeff was saying on headlines. If you just throw strikes, the way the defense can play behind you, it's, uh, it's this team, that's just really impressive. That's just really impressive to bounce back from that series and play your bitter rival that you've had a history now of 15 years, essentially, at least, yeah, basically about 15 years of losing to, and to come out and run rule them. Yeah, man. After their big series win, they got all that momentum, and you go and humiliate them in front of 3,000 of their fans um, in a really cool environment. I hope any anybody listening to this, I hope one time you go watch that this game in Jacksonville. Um, I still think it should be a home-and-home home series. I'm not saying it shouldn't. <laughs> But the Jacksonville part of this thing is is cool. Um, yeah, man, I, I just – that's you, – you've obviously infused the roster with talent, with a, a, a terrific lineup, and you can pick up the ball. All that's really, really good. It's all important, very important. But also to have that mental ability to just shake that off because it's baseball, and you better have that ability because if you can't, you're not going to last long as a baseball player, and your team isn't going to be very good. If you let one loss – uh, or one bad outing, one bad game, one bad weekend, turn into another embarrassment two days later because you can't pick yourself up off the mat, well, that's trouble. But this team is just – maybe it's just too talented offensively for that to ever happen. I don't know. I like the yeah, sound Cam of Smith that. Had, Cam Smith had a quiet two for five <laughs> yeah. with a double off the fence that was probably hit 200 miles an hour. You know, Tibbs, only three hits. You know, it's just on and on and on. Like, Faro is the one guy in the lineup in Clemson that didn't hit a home run. And so then he goes the next day and hits two. <laughs> he heard you. He heard you on yeah. the show the other day. He, he and Cantu both had only one home run on the season coming into Tuesday, 
And then they both hit two balls. Didn't they both hit two balls? Oh, no, can't two hit yeah, one. Yeah. But then, but he, he hit a to, second one of the season, and then yeah. and then our man Faroe hit two yeah. and had five ribbies. It's just – it's a good lineup, man. It's a good lineup. Yeah. I think Cam Smith is showing that he's batting 444. I think the broadcast team said he's he's batting 400 with runners on base this year. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's really Th- good. I'm glad I didn't have to listen to that broadcast team, <laughs> oh, by the way. Geez. Holy moly, that sounds like it was a night. So they were the Florida radio team? Yeah, yeah. But it's, what was the who, – so who was calling the game on the radio for Florida? Nobody? Them, them. They just, they just synced up. It was up. a simulcast? Yeah, they, they like synced up the radio broadcast to the to the video feed that the SEC Network Plus was doing. Oh, uh, well, then I think you could forgive them a little, right? Because they but wouldn't you know, think – But you still well, know yes, that they you have to know. Being You're right. They have to know that they – they have to know that the game is on the SEC, that people can watch it on online. But I'm sure they're thinking the only people listening to us are Gator fans, so yeah. we can talk like this about this game, N- not thinking, oh, there's probably thousands upon thousands of Florida State fans interested in this game and watching it. And you come off as such a homer. Yeah. Um, but, you know, Florida State doesn't have that problem. Nope. Lou Allen, <laughs> Lou, Lou, he ain't, he ain't no. doing that. He hates no. the Gators more than anybody. <laughs> he grew up playing football against them. But yeah, he's not he's not as uh you know as one sided as these uh, guys appeared to be. I think it was the fifth inning. And I think Florida State was up like at that point. I think six to three, and they struck out. And the way he called the strikeout was just like, and see ya. He retires that seminal. It was like whoa. Yeah. He's like you're you're busting out your, you know, the twenty seventh out of a of a game that clinches a series against the top five team or something yeah. like to do a Tuesday midweek game when you're losing. To your in-state rival, but hey, they they can think about that on the bus ride back to Gainesville. So yeah, it's a toughie, huh? It's a toughie to lose to. You. They, they, so when was the last time Florida State beat them in a series? I don't know, but I think they said that was the first time Florida State beat Florida in Jacksonville since 2015. Oh sweet Moses! Oh. Come on. Oh. Anyway, but hey, that's what they've won the series. Yeah, we did. And look, those we we don't like this crazy every two week midweek series against your arch rival, but these are big wins at the end of the season especially because Florida only goes up when they lose. So that's their 10th loss now, so they'll be ranked number one, I'm sure, by the time next week rolls around. But these are big losses, or big wins. These are big RPI wins for Florida State. And they could use a couple after blowing the two that they blew uh, uh, last weekend in Clemson. Just, again, really impressive bounce back, man. That's that's good to see. And, and if you don't have tickets, come out and watch this baseball team. Yes. Just to watch them hit. I mean, and then watch the, the – you know, Leiter and Arnold are really good – they play good. De- they're just a fun team to watch play. They don't strike out a ton. They hit the ball very hard everywhere, and they pick it up and don't embarrass you on the bases. It's a it's a good product, really good product. A lot of games between now and then, but the, they'll finish it out against Florida in Tallahassee at Hauser on April 9th, Tuesday. So Come and get some. Come and get some, Sully. <laughs> uh, come and get some recruiting news over at warchant.com. Matt Lassere. Uh, caught up with a five-star offensive tackle, Josh Petty, who was on campus yesterday watching practice. So I uh, get the latest on all things recruiting over at warchant.com. We'll have a Renegade Express mailback thread up on the forum. So jump in there. We'll record that at some point, and uh, that'll be your Thursday pod. And then Friday will be our thoughts on the words that we hear after speaking to Coach Norvell and company after the scrimmage on Thursday. So we got you covered. Jeff Cameron's got you from 1 to 3 o'clock. Uh, I, I, Tom Lang might be in studio with him, I think. Yeah, the, yeah, he's in studio with us on Tuesday for headlines. All right, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, Tom's got trench observations as well. Ira's going to crank some stuff out. Corey's got stuff up on the site. Uh, it's football season. It's baseball season, softball season. And we'll see what goes on the portal for the basketball team. It's always some season. We're always getting you covered over at WarChant.com. Thanks for listening to Wake Up War Champ presented by the Corner Pocket Barn Grill.